marvelous to see so many of the folks out. It'll be a privilege for us to listen to a very interesting, enlightening, and encouraging talk that will be delivered by Mr. Schroeder. Mr. Schroeder has had many years of experience in the ministry and has had uh, also many years of instructing classes, which, of course, being his duty and responsibility, always were appreciate the expressions made by these brothers because of their study. So this afternoon, we want to pay particular note to what he says, and if you have a pencil and paper, you may want to jot down these notes and use it when the opportunity arises, and also for your own instruction. The talk is, let the Bible set things straight. Now, some may question themselves as to, are you mixed up as to the divine will? Why is it vital to be set straight now? So we'll turn the platform over now to Mr. Schroeder. You will all agree that we're living in a crazy world. We have more religion today that's being practiced in many countries of the earth, but in spite of more religion, we have less spirituality. We have more talk of peace by the rulers of the world, yet there's less actual peace. Yes, the entire world seems to be mixed up, and there seem to be no men or group of men that can set things straight. Jehovah, the great God of the heavens, knew that man would come to such a period of time, and therefore God had his own program for setting things straight. The Apostle Paul mentions in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired of God and beneficial for setting things things straight. So the great God of heaven thousands of years ago began to make provisions through a series of inspired scriptures that were gradually gathered together that would uh, be his total provision to aid men to set things straight in due time. So we today in this generation of great confusion have this wonderful gift of God, the Bible. And the Bible is the only uh, book, it's the only source of information today that can set things straight and uh, help men and women of goodwill to set things straight in their own mind. You know, the Bible has been translated now into 1,125 different languages. There are 2,700 languages in the earth. So the Bible has been translated in not quite the majority of the languages of the earth. But the interesting thing is that the Bible is translated in all the leading languages, even Russian, Chinese, Japanese, Many of the various African tongues, all the uh, European languages, so that even though not the majority of languages has the Bible been translated in, yet the Bible has been translated in languages that are understood by 95.6 of Earth's inhabitants. So truly the great God has provided a universal instrument that can speak to the vast majority of mankind. And there we have a provision available to help the honest people to set things straight. Now, he's provided the instrument, and he also has a program for setting things straight. And that's the objective of our uh, discussion this afternoon. It's rather interesting to know that in Hebrews... Uh, the Apostle Paul said 
in his day that the law and the tabernacle and other such provisions were legal requirements pertaining to the flesh and were imposed until the appointed time to set things straight. And when Jesus walked the earth, he set many things straight. And the apostles during their preaching days set many things straight. And we have the product of their work here in the Bible. And therefore, if they set things straight in men's minds in their day, we can use the same information today to set things straight in our minds and in minds of inquiring men and women in all the earth. And that is the amazing power and purpose of the Holy Scriptures which we have. Now let's examine the program uh, for setting things straight. We see in the days of Isaiah that there was great confusion. And in the New World Translation, we now get a, a clear understanding of the situation in Israel and what uh, proceeded to set things straight. It begins with verse 18 in chapter 1, New World Translation. Come now, you people, and let us set matters straight between us, says Jehovah. Though the sins of you people should prove to be as scarlet, they will be made white just like snow. Though they should be red like crimson cloth, they will become even like wool. Now this is an outstanding scripture which many of you have used in times past, but the King James says, come let's reason together. But notice here it says, come let's set matters straight between us. You know, the old uh, translation, when you stop to think of it, uh, doesn't give you much accurate knowledge, because after all, the Most High God is so great in his power and wisdom and intellect, could we hope to reason with him and to make him change his view here and change a little bit there and see things in our way, give and take with God, so to speak? No. But here now God says to Israel, come, the time has now come to set matters straight between us. The reason there was confusion in Israel was because Israel was out of harmony with the living God. And that's actually the same reason today why we have world confusion. The vast majority of mankind are not in harmony with the living God. And for that reason, they don't know where they're going. They have no vision. They are blind. They're confused. They go from one mixed-up situation to another. So God says, come now. Let's set matters straight between us. And that's the way to get things started in the right way. So now he says, though your sins have been great... God says now he's willing to forgive them and to teach them a correct way. If you people show willingness and do listen, the good of the land you will eat. But if you people refuse and are actually rebellious, with a sword you will be eaten up, for the very mouth of Jehovah has spoken it. In Israel, the vast majority of people refuse to set matters straight between themselves and the living God. And uh, when the time came, 607 B.C., Jerusalem was overthrown and Israel and Judah came to an end. The same situation is today. The vast majority of people refuse to heed the Bible and to have matters set straight between them and God. And they too are heading on for the point of great destruction, just like the vast majority of the people of Judah did. But notice, before Jerusalem fell in 607 B.C., there were honest-hearted Jews that did hear and took steps to set things straight between themselves and God. And they were a minority, and they're called a remnant, a Jewish remnant. And the same thing is true today. There are a few sincere, honest Christians that do take the Bible seriously and for many years now have been following the program of the Bible in setting matters straight between themselves and the living God. And we now call those the Christian remnant. And they have been, uh, 
They committed many sins in times past, like God says here. Though their sins were like crimson red, yet God has washed them clean and made them white and has made them righteous and has given them a clean standing. And so we have a long history now of many years of a Christian remnant, especially since 1919, who have become cleansed in the sight of God and who have gone forth to preach the good news of the established kingdom in all parts of the earth. And they, as the Christian remnant, have now a standing with the living God. And they have a long record of a good standing with God. So, like Israel of old, the minority did set things straight. But the vast majority rolled right on to the point of destruction. Then... The New World Translation goes on to the next chapter and shows that there will be others may set straight and uh, rectified in their position toward God other than the Israelites or the spiritual Israelites in our day. For example, Isaiah 2, 4 goes on, and he will certainly render judgment among the nations and set matters straight respecting many peoples. So the program back there was first to set straight some of the Jews, the Jewish remnant, and then proceed to set matters straight with many peoples, Gentiles. And so we find in our day, too, God first set matters straight with a minority of Christian remnant, and now he is inviting all the many peoples, or the Gentiles, the non-spiritual Israelites, to also have matters set straight between them and God and therefore get a standing that will mean salvation. The whole context here of Isaiah 2 says, and it must occur in the final part of the days, see, throwing it into our time, that the mountain of the house of Jehovah will become firmly established above the top of the mountains. So God's temple organization as represented on the earth by the remnant, becomes high, tops all things in the earth as far as importance is concerned. And it will certainly be lifted up above the hills, and to it all the nations must stream. A great crowd of men and women of goodwill will come and stream in. And many peoples will certainly go and say, Come, you people, let us go up to the mountain of Jehovah, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will instruct us about his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion will go forth the law, the word of Jehovah out of Jerusalem, and he will certainly render judgment among the nations and set matters straight respecting many peoples. Well, we know from actual physical facts, since the year 1931, and more particularly 1935, A great crowd of men and women of goodwill have been flowing into the New World Society, following the leadership of the faithful remnant who had set set matters straight many years before and are walking together in God's holy ways. Now this program of setting matters straight, first God using a little few and then appealing to the greater number, is also found in the famous prophecy of Isaiah 49, New World Translation. There, beginning with verse 6 in prophecy, which has its fulfillment now in our days, we see there again that there's a program of uh, setting matters straight indicated. It has been no trivial matter for you to become to me a servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, that's the spiritual Israelites, to bring them back, even the safeguarded ones of Israel. I also have given you for a light to the nations, that my salvation may come to be to the extremity of the earth. So Christ Jesus first restores relationship between God and spiritual Israelites, and then he becomes the light of all the others who must also have reconciliation. In an acceptable time I have answered you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you, and I kept safeguarding you, 
that I might give you as a covenant for the people to rehabilitate the land, to bring about the repossessing of the desolated hereditary possessions, to say to the prisoners, come out, to those who are in the darkness, reveal yourselves. By the ways they shall pasture, and on all beaten paths their pasturing will be. So there a vast multitude must come out, come out of their prisons. Uh, in Babylonish mental captivity, you might say, pagan thinking, which has been the reason for their being out of harmony and out of step with the living God. And they must now come out of those uh, imprisoned uh, places and now reveal themselves and begin to feed on the beaten paths that God has set. They will not go hungry, neither will they go thirsty, nor will parching heat or sun strike them. So there again in this prophecy, first it's spiritual Israel that is restored in relationship, and then it's the nations who are told to come out in great numbers and also have matters set straight. This program of using a little few first and then a larger number, you remember, is also indicated in the prophecy of Zechariah. Thus saith Jehovah of hosts, if it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people, in those days should it also be marvelous in mine eyes? But now I will not be unto the remnant of this people as in the former days, saith Jehovah, for there shall be the seed of peace, the vine shall give its fruit, the ground shall give its increase, the heavens shall give their due, and I will cause the remnant of this people to inherit all things. And today we're living in a time when a Christian remnant have become heritor, inheritor of God's kingdom interests here on earth. We'll see that in a few moments. And then... The prophecy of Zechariah goes on to say, Thus saith Jehovah of hosts, it shall come to pass. Thus saith the Lord, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all the languages of the nations. They shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. In other words, this Jew had already set matters straight between himself and God. He had now been recognized by God. He had been justified. He was considered righteous, and therefore God was with that Jew. Well, there's a picture of how God is with the Christian remnant since 1919. God is their God. God has recognized them. They have a righteous standing. Uh, they are Jehovah's Witnesses. They are his official ambassadors here on the earth. And now notice that there are ten men from all parts of the earth that now see here God's hand is upon this group. And now they go to take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew and follow along so that this righteous small group in turn can tell the larger group pictured by the ten how they too may have set matters straight between themselves and the living God. In, order to, in other words, have reconciliation. So the vast crowd must have their matters set straight with the aid of the smaller group that God has previously justified and brought to a righteous position. That's why Jesus referred to this smaller group having trained them, tested them. And he refers to them in Matthew 24, in the famous chapter on the last days. He said, Who really is the faithful and discreet slave, whom his master appointed over his domestics to give them their food at the proper time? Happy is that slave if his master, on arriving, finds him doing so. Truly, I say to you, he will appoint him over all his belongings." And there again the facts show, according to this prophecy, that when Jesus came back the second time after the establishment of his kingdom in 1914, did he find faith on this earth? Did he find a small group of real Christian men and women that were taking the Bible seriously and were trying to live by Bible standards and who were 
spirit begotten children of God and doing his will as best they understood? Yes. And therefore that small group of spiritual Israelites, so to speak, part of the bride of Christ, Jesus now says, you are the faithful and discreet slave. And he's going to give to this small group, notice, all his belongings. And these belongings are all the kingdom interests with respect to the earth. And they become heirs of all the kingdom interests now. And so, here again then, this small group has been found, they were tested, tried, and found faithful. And now are a righteous nucleus that can teach reliably now a great crowd of others who must also set matters straight between themselves and God in all parts of the earth. In other words, a little yeast of goodness, if that can be developed, that little yeast of goodness can spread to the whole loaf or organization of many, many others. So notice God is taking great pains to develop that small nucleus, test it, purify it, cleanse it, and there he has it, and now he can build a new world society around it and expand it to all the earth. And these others then can learn righteous ways from this little group. It's also pictured in the law. You remember the law of harvesting. Whenever there was to be a harvest, the man, the owner of the field, could not harvest 100%. He always had to leave gleanings, the borders of the field, did he not? And then the poor people could come in free of charge and take the gleanings of the harvest crop and use it for their food. Well, there's a picture again of how Jehovah God in 1918 didn't take all the 144,000 to heaven in this great harvest. No, he left a remnant, a gleaning, here on the border, so to speak, of the field. And he left them there for what purpose? As food for the poor. And who are the poor? Again, our ten men from all nations, the great crowd, who also must have matters set straight. And so they will have leadership from this small group that will guide and direct them. Well, now let's examine again a little bit more from another angle this small group that has been built up in a righteous way as a little leaven of goodness to affect the greater whole that God is going to be dealing with. Well, here again, the New World Translation helps us out. The Bible in the original Hebrew gives the idea that God has certain ones that uh, he develops an intimacy with. And this small group is called an intimate group where God uh, deals with them privately. Now let's take a look at Job 29, 4, and 5 where we have the first mention made of this matter of intimacy. And Job, you remember, uh, pictures God dealing first with the spiritual Israelites, the Christian remnant, and pictures their experiences from 1914 to 1918 and then how they are restored in 1919. So Job says, just as I happened to be in the days of my prime when intimacy with God was at my tent. Yes, the Christian remnant have an intimacy with God. And how do they have that? They have that by reason of being spirit begotten and being members of Christ's body. You remember Christ Jesus said in John 17 chapter, he was praying for his body members that they may be in union with me as I am in union with you, or Jehovah. So it's the Christian spirit begotten ones that are tied in closely with God. They have this intimacy through Jesus Christ. 
Now, this intimacy is also mentioned by David in Psalm 55, 14. And David uh, also pictures the anointed ones. David himself was anointed and speaks of this intimacy. He says, uh, Because we used to enjoy sweet intimacy together, in the house of God we used to walk with the throng. So these of the anointed remnant have sweet intimacy in the temple, in the temple priesthood, which comprises the 144,000. And so they walk together in this close union, one with another, with the living God. And then the Bible shows that uh, this intimate group is the small group that God makes a covenant with. And that's revealed in uh, Psalm 25, 14. The intimacy with Jehovah belongs to those fearful of him, also his covenant to cause them to know it. We know from other scriptures that the new covenant is only made between Jehovah God and the 144,000 who come into this intimate, close, uh, faithful, discreet relationship, you might say, with the living God. And those who are in this intimate group that have been made righteous by God are used to sing God's praises. Psalm 111, 1. Praise Jah, you people. I shall laud Jehovah with all my heart in the intimate group of upright ones and the assembly. So there, this intimate group are dedicated to the purpose of praising God and all those who belong to it serve God and laud him with all their heart. Now they come to the interesting thing. In this watchtower that we had the resolution presented, the November 1st watchtower, did you notice that the clergy who are exposed in this watchtower are uh, shown to have uh, been excluded from Jehovah's intimate group. And so this is one of the key texts found in the Resolution Watchtower, Jeremiah 23, 22. And notice what that scripture says. And he speaks of the false prophets. I did not send the prophets, yet they themselves ran. I did not speak to them, yet they themselves prophesied. Same is true with the clergy today who claim to be Christians and leaders at that. But if they had stood in my intimate group, then they would have made my people hear my words, and they would have caused them to turn back from their bad way. So if the clergy had been of God's intimate group of anointed ones, then they certainly would have done a wonderful witness work in the earth. But the clergy have failed, and therefore they show that they are not part of that intimate group because the intimate group does praise God and does accomplish his will and is that small nucleus of righteousness that can spread it on to others as a little yeast of goodness will spread to the whole loaf. So the clergy fail to be part of that intimate group. Well, now then, what does this mean in the program of setting things straight for the great crowd. Well, we know that the great crowd of men of goodwill from all nations must also be reconciled to Jehovah, and they must also establish a record of righteousness. Now, how can they do that? Now, they haven't had the long opportunity, as the Christian remnant have, nor have they been tested in the same way as the Christian remnant have. So they don't have that long record. But now, in this short time before Armageddon, they too have got to make peace with God. They've got to have a good standing. So how are they going to get it? Well, Jesus lovingly uh, pictures that in uh, Matthew 25. You know the parable of the sheep and goats and how only the sheep who do acts of goodness 
to my brothers. Jesus' brothers are the ones that are going to have a record of righteousness applied to them, to their account. In reply, the king will say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it unto me. So the great crowd have got to come into touch, like these ten men who touched the skirt of him as a Jew, and must actively come and support the small nucleus of Christian remnant, Christ brothers. And as they do that, they're going to receive the favor from Jesus Christ. And notice that when Armageddon comes, he will say to the goats, These depart into everlasting cutting off, but to the sheep, the righteous ones, into everlasting life. So those who make things straight between themselves and God today, as the great crowd, they're not going to perish, but they're going to have everlasting life, even as Jesus Christ pictured here in this prophecy of the time of the end. Ezekiel, the 47th chapter, is another amazing prophecy that uh, shows about our day and this program of setting things straight. The prophecy opens up by speaking of Jehovah's temple organization and uh, waters issued out from the threshold of the house, the temple, and flowed eastwards. And the waters came down from under the right side of the house on the south of the altar. Then he brought me out by the way of the gate northward and led me around by the way without the, unto the outer gate, by the way of the gate that looketh toward the east. And waters began to flow. Now waters in the Bible we know picture the flow of truth, waters of truth. And here from the temple begins the flow of waters of truth. And they begin to flow in a small way in 1919 through the faithful and discreet slave. Now, the prophecy says, go and measure. Well, he measured every thousand cubits. And as he got farther and farther from the temple, deeper and deeper got the water. And so, when he measured the first thousand, why, the waters came up to his ankles. So, as we see from facts, by 1922, the flow of waters of truth had become considerably greater than they were in 1919. Then he measured another thousand, which leads us to about 1925, three years later, and there the waters were up to the knees. And we know from facts of truth and history of Jehovah's Witnesses now, the waters of truth got much greater by 1925. And then he measured another thousand, and uh, uh, and afterwards he measured a thousand, and it was a river, and I could not pass through. Excuse me. Then he passed. He measured another thousand, and the waters came up to the loins. So another three years brings us to about 1928, and the waters of truth were still greater. And then he measures another. Thousand cubits, and by that time the water is a river, he has to swim over it. And the watchtower shows that by 1931, the waters of truth were so great that uh, no powers of the old world could overthrow now the Christian remnant. We know that uh, Hitler tried it, uh, and uh, he failed, and others have tried it to destroy Jehovah's Witnesses, but they have failed. Because now we have this powerful water of truth available through the Christian remnant, and now the waters are flowing out to all parts of the earth. Well, then uh, the waters reach the Dead Sea, according to this prophecy. And the Dead Sea pictures the circumstances of spiritual death. All mankind today being in this mixed-up, confused situation, not knowing what the divine will is, not knowing what their relationship to the living God is, they're just spiritually dead. Like Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead, referring to the spiritually dead. 
So, now, as soon as these living waters of truth hit the Dead Sea, what happens? Well, now let's, let's read what the prophecy says. Then he said unto me, These waters issue forth toward the eastern region, shall go down into the Arabah, and they shall go toward the sea. That means the Dead Sea. And into the sea shall the waters go which were made to issue forth, and the waters shall be healed. So when these waters of truth hit the dead circumstances in which men and women find themselves out of harmony with God, this water of truth has the power of healing those circumstances, changing the circumstances, and making the circumstances such that people begin to open their minds and their hearts and to now really understand what the Bible message has. And so that's why after 1931, the waters of truth have hit the Dead Sea of the world and made it possible now for thousands and hundreds of thousands now. More than 800,000 have taken their stand because of the change of circumstances. And as we also know, uh, the later we've come along, the more quickly the circumstances change. In other words, it's easier for a person to come into the truth today than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago because the waters are flowing so deeply now and strongly that they're changing these circumstances in which people find themselves and can open up quickly in understanding and that they can come out of their former dead Babylonish uh, circumstances of situations. Now notice what goes on. It shall come to pass that every living creature which swarmeth in every place whither the rivers come shall live. They shall be a very great multitude of fish. So with a change of circumstances, now we find in the Dead Sea fish. Now you know in the literal Dead Sea today there are no fish. It's a salt sea. It's impossible for anything to live in that sea. But in this... Uh, uh, prophetic sea that has changed, now it's possible for people to live as fish. So the fish here picture the great crowd who now become spiritually alive due to the change of circumstances. They're uh, no longer bound by their former religious blindness and their new circumstances immediately enable them to live and become active witnesses like Jehovah's Witnesses and they seem to be powerful and uh, spiritually alive, just like the remnant who have helped them uh, to come into the truth. Now notice, since we have such a great multitude of fish, uh, what's going to be done with them? Well, the prophecy goes on to say, And it shall come to pass that fishers shall stand by it. Now these fishers... In the new book, uh, You May Survive Armageddon into God's New World, it uh, pictures the remnant again, who are fishers of men that Jesus spoke about when he talk, talked to the disciples. And so the remnant now, as this small nucleus of the intimate group, they are the fishers who now fish out these live fish from the Dead Sea of circumstances and uh, uh, fee, uh, fish them out and uh, then they further feed them and uh, keep them alive. And notice that uh, this small group of fishers are not just going to have one little fish rod just fishing one little fish out at a time. That would be very slow because according to this prophecy, the Dead Sea of circumstances produce a multitude of fish. So that's why the prophecy goes on to say that the small group of fishers use nets and they spread nets and they bring out the fish by the multitude. And so that's the amazing thing. The small group of Christian remnant, only numbering about 15,000 in all the earth today, are able to do a great preaching work and to bring out nearly 800,000 of other sheep today who are live fish and, uh, like the fishermen themselves, are able to do a great work for God's purposes. 
So, in this program of setting things straight, God has provided the fishermen, he's provided the waters of truth through the Bible that can change the circumstances and enable you to spiritually live and to be recognized by the living God as one of his servants. Now, all of us here this afternoon, we truly thank the living God that he changed our circumstances so that we could begin to get our eyes open, our spiritual eyes open, to the wonderful words of truth in the Bible. And then, when we now see what our new relationship is to the living God, then we do something about it. We actually begin to live as fish and uh, do something constructive and seek to be further fed and to continue to spiritually live and continue to use the waters of truth. Now, then, some will say, well, here you now have a new world society that has been amazingly developing. We had this terrific great convention this last summer, which has been a worldwide witness. Now there you are. Now you're going to have class distinction. Here you've got a little group that God dealt with first and gave them the enlightenment and fortified them and made them part of his intimate group. Now they're going to be set up as uh, the first class or the high class, the aristocracy. And then you're going to have all the others are going to be in a lower caste. You'll have a caste system, something like you have in India. Well, no. Even, Jehovah God, even though Jehovah God had this program of calling a small group first and then a larger group later, yet we notice that when he said, when Jesus said, Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, these I, should, I must also bring. And he says he's going to gather them together and there's going to be just one flock, one homogeneous, harmonious United flock. There's not going to be a flock with two castes. The caste of the anointed remnant and the caste of the great crowd. No, he said there's going to be just one flock and only one shepherd. No ruling class. We see that also reflected in the law of Moses. The law of Moses said that there would be only one law or one code of law for the whole nation. Regardless of whether you were homeborn or a foreigner, made no difference in Israel. Under the typical theocratic government, everyone was the same. And then the law further says that the homeborn must treat well the stranger. So the law of Moses forbade the caste system. It was impossible to develop the caste system under the law of Moses. And um, Equal dignity had to be given in Israel. Whether you were a foreigner or were an Israelite, you had the equal standing. You were considered a human creature with equal dignity. So today, these are pictures then. In the New World Society of one flock, although we do have spiritual Israelites and we have the non-spiritual Israelites, we are together all as one society. We have one organization. We have one theocratic procedure. There are not several procedures. We have just the one congregation in each little community. And we must all give each other equal dignity. We are all one. We're all equal. We have an equal standing before God. So this program of setting things straight does not involve the caste system, but the New World Society is a society of equal men and women enjoying equal dignity. Now, Revelation 7 further discusses this situation. You're familiar with this chapter. There again, God deals in the first part of the chapter with the 144,000. God uh, is going to build his new heavens organization first. And then when he's built his new heavens organization, then he's going to build the new earth and make provisions 
for the new earth society, you might say. So there are first things first. Jehovah God first provided Jesus Christ, the ransomer. And when he provided him, then he went ahead to provide the 144,000, the capital of the new world. And when that was provided, then he goes ahead to the third step and provides the subjects of the new world, those that will make up the new earth. So in Revelation 7, after he, he uh, produces the 144,000, then he says, After these things I saw and look, a great crowd, which no man was able to number, out of all nations, tribes, and peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne. Now notice they're standing before the throne. Now that means that they must now recognize Jehovah God as the sovereign. They have set matters straight between themselves and God. If they had not set matters straight, they could not stand before the throne of God. They couldn't recognize his sovereign position because they would be in a confused position like most mankind today. They prayed to a trinity. So uh, how can they uh, properly understand uh, the matter of Godship and who they're praying to. It reminds me of this uh, visitor we had the other day at Gilead. She uh, is a graduate student at the University of Syracuse and uh, she is writing her thesis and uh, for the master's degree and she chose the subject the Watchtower magazine. And uh, so she had her professor write our school whether she could come to Gilead and use our library to do research work in the Watchtower magazine, as she understood that we had all the old Watchtowers back to 1879. So we wrote back and said, yes, we'd be very happy to have her come. So she came two weeks ago, and she stayed. She came Thursday, and she stayed Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and went back Sunday afternoon. So she... We gave her a little table in the corner of the library and showed her where the magazines were, and she started her work. Then she asked whether she could attend our lectures in the afternoon, which she did. And uh, she stayed in one of our dormitories, and of course, in the evenings, uh, and incidentally, she was from Indonesia originally, and was studying journalism in this country and expected to go back to her country as a journalist, newspaper woman. Well, uh, Many of us had opportunity to speak to her from time to time. But uh, on one occasion when I spoke to her, she said, do you mind if I ask you a few questions? She says, uh, I've been, uh, I'm a Baptist by religion. And she says, uh, uh, what is your view about Christmas? So uh, I had the privilege of telling her our position on Christmas, that uh, uh, Christmas could not be the celebration of the birth of Christ because he was not born at that time. And in any case, the Bible does not uh, authorize our celebrating birthdays. And the whole thing has become so very commercialized and uh, unchristian. It's really pagan glitter that has developed. Well, she said, you know, I'm glad you, you mentioned that because that's the way I feel about it. And then uh, we went on to other doctrines and the Trinity came up. She says, uh, while I'm a Baptist, she says, I never can understand the matter of the Trinity. And so I explained to her our position, the supremacy of one living God, and that, she chose, that he chose the one ransomer, Jesus Christ, and made him the king of the new world. And then, then he's gone on to produce his 144,000 new heavens. And now he's, in his last days, producing the final part of the new world, the new earth section, and so on. So after her stay, she really uh, had her spiritual eyes open. And uh, she asked whether she could uh, somehow uh, go to our school instead of uh, the University of Syracuse. Well, I said, no, uh, you have to meet certain requirements and explain that to her. But she says, you know, she says, the spirit here is so wonderful. I never experienced anything like this in all my life. She said, the situation is so different from what you have here and what we have at our school. She says, nobody's interested really in us. Then she told me her story. She says, I had never heard anything about Jehovah's Witnesses. She says, in 1955, on the way coming to the United States, I stopped in London. And I saw 
uh, people all over town with these convention badges. And uh, there, for the first time, I heard about Jehovah's Witnesses. I asked some friends who they were, and she said, well, they're having a world convention here, and so on. Well, then she comes to school at Syracuse, and uh, one of her courses is the law course. And there she studies our uh, Supreme Court victories on freedom of press, because she's interested in uh, journalism, one right after another. And we have more uh, victories in the field of freedom of press than any other organization on the earth. So she asked her students, well, who are these Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, her, her fellow students seemed to discourage her. And then she asked her professor, who are these Jehovah's Witnesses? She says, we don't have them in our country. Uh, she'd never come across them. So uh, he said, well, they're a minority group, and he didn't know too much about it, about it. So she took the initiative. So she went to her telephone book and looked up Jehovah's Witnesses. And there she found in Syracuse a telephone number of one of the kingdom halls. And she called up and asked for the time of the meetings, and she went. And then she uh, got in touch with the Watchtower magazine, and that's when she made up her mind she's going to write her thesis on the Watchtower, because she saw there that the Watchtower is distributed in more than three million copies. She said, that's, that must be amazing, such a distribution of a magazine. So uh, she has uh, that way been brought in touch with uh, our work, and she's uh, uh, wonderfully impressed and really uh, she went away a, a real sheep. She didn't want to go. And arrangements have been made for some of our students to follow up and to have studies with her in Syracuse. And she wants to also, this Christmas time, she has a vacation. And she wants to go to Brooklyn to see the printing plant and to see the headquarters of the society. And arrangements have been made for her to do that. So here is a lady way out from Indonesia who has been touched by these waters of truth, and she's reacting wonderfully, favorably, in a humble way. Well, all of us have had many other experiences that way too, have we not? And then notice, you see, that this great crowd now must stand before the throne. They must have succeeded in recognizing the majesty of the living God. Now what do they do about it? Well, they set matters straight by dressing themselves in white robes. They've got to make themselves clean, put away their former sinful ways. Like Isaiah said, even though your sins are red to scarlet, now you can wash your position and make them white as snow. And the great crowd must do that just like the anointed. They can't uh, come into God's new world society with bloody hands. They must come with clean hands. And in their palm branches... They must have palm branches in their hands where they're waving the kingdom, accepting the kingdom. And then notice it says, they keep on crying with a loud voice saying, salvation we owe to our God. So when the great crowd come into a knowledge of the truth and have set matters straight between themselves and God, they keep on crying. They don't only become a minister for 24 hours or they don't only just make one declaration of dedication by being water immersed and that's the end of it. No, notice the New World Translation says they keep on crying. They become ministers continually. And what's the little sermon that they give? Well, the sermon they give in quotation says, salvation we owe to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. So they tell the world now that their hope of salvation rests on the great sovereign God who's on the throne, who's the king of the universe, and to the Lamb, Jesus Christ. So they've advanced to that great knowledge and appreciation and have set matters straight. And they're not serving a trinity, but they're serving just the one God who's on the throne and Jesus Christ as his Lamb. Well, notice too how accurate the prophecy is. The uh, angel is asked... Uh, who are these dressed in white robes, and who are they, and where do they come from? So right away I said to him, My Lord, you are the one that knows. And he said to me, These are the ones that come out of the great tribulation. So it's in the last days, the great tribulation upon Satan's world, when the great crowd now set 
things straight and use the Bible, God's word, to do that. They have washed their robes, again the second time that's mentioned, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That is why they are before the throne of God and they are rendering him sacred service day and night in his temple. So there's a second time mentioning they become ministers and they continually serve him day and night in his temple. And then God says that they will be spiritually fed and uh, the sun will not beat down on them and uh, they become his people. So God's program of setting straight things straight is very wonderful. And the Bible does that. And uh, God first straightens out a small group. And when he has them straightened out, they in turn can help the great crowd to get things straight. And when the great crowd gets things straight, they can help still others of the great crowd to get things straight. So that's why we have a great Bible study program in all parts of the earth, don't we? And that's why Jehovah's Witnesses have our assemblies. And that's why we have the big international conventions like we had this last summer, that we might further get things straightened out in our minds, that we may learn more about the divine will. That's the big thing. God's will. Let God's will be done on earth. I had the privilege of uh, sharing in a television broadcast in Ithaca uh, in October. And a few weeks later, in my house-to-house work, uh, on the campus section there, the um, a lady said, uh, invited me in. I gave her my sermon on the condition of the dead. She says, uh, I've seen you on the television. Well, I thought she meant she's seen Jehovah's Witnesses uh, uh, in connection with our convention. I said, yes, there were several convention, s- several uh, television broadcasts concerning our convention. No, she said, I saw you on the, on the television screen. And so she said, uh, but there's one thing that I never forget what you said a couple of weeks ago, that the destiny for honest people is to live on the earth forever. She says, that sounds good to me. She says, I've been a Sunday school teacher for many years and never really wanted to go to heaven. So I had the chance to really uh, have a long study with her, and I've made several back calls, and I'm looking forward to having a study with her. But uh, she was impressed by that point we mentioned in the broadcast. The announcer asked me, he says, in a minute and a half, uh, tell me where your teachings differ from the church's. Well, a minute and a half is not very long. So I quickly said, well, we don't believe in the Trinity. We believe in just the one most high God, the sovereign majesty of the universe. And then I went in and I said, we take the Lord's Prayer seriously. And that when we pray, your will be done on earth. We're looking forward to the earth being the destiny for the majority of of mankind. And that was the point that had impressed this lady. Well, and that is the situation. The Bible sets matters straight now. Only 144,000 are going to heaven. And the Bible further sets matters straight that the destiny for the great crowd is to live on a beautiful paradise earth forever. And as you know, when we do our witness work, most of the people that we talk to, their natural desire, their natural inclination is to live on the earth. Most people naturally don't want to go to heaven. They want to stay here, don't they? And that's just the purpose of the living God. And he's now setting these matters straight in our minds. Our forefathers were confused. They thought everybody was going to heaven or hell. But now the Bible sets matters straight and the vast majority are going to live on this beautiful earth to the praise of the living God. And so that's why we today like to now use the words of Isaiah 12. And uh, the great crowd today want to stay spiritually awake. Now the remnant are already spiritually awake. And they have a long record of faithfulness. But now what about you, great crowd? Are you going to stay spiritually awake during these times of increasing crisis? And are you going to build a good record now, like the remnant have built a record for many, many years? That's up to you. And God is confident that the vast majority of the great crowd are going to build a good record 
and are going to remain faithful right up to Armageddon. In that day, you will be sure to say, I shall praise you, O Jehovah, for although you got incensed at me, your anger gradually turned back. All of us were out of harmony with God. We didn't have things right. We were mixed up. But now God has turned us back. You proceeded to comfort me. Look, God is my salvation. I shall trust and be in no dread. For Jah Jehovah is my strength and my might, and he came to be the salvation of me. So whether we're the great crowd or the little intimate group of the anointed remnant, we all can say the same thing. Jehovah truly is our strength, and he's our salvation. With exaltation, you people will certainly to be certain to draw water out of the springs of salvation. And in that day you will certainly say, Lord Jehovah, you people, call upon his name. Make known among the peoples his dealings. Make mention that his name is to be put on high. Make melody to Jehovah, for he has done surpassingly. This is to be made known in all the earth. So let us continue to rejoice and work together as Jehovah's Witnesses, as all part of the wonderful, growing new world society. We have had things set straight in our minds. Let us go out now and show other people who are confused how they too can set things straight. Let the Bible set matters straight in their minds, even as it has done in our minds. And as we do so, we give praise and thanks to the great living God, Jehovah.